Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Hara, and I'm your host for Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. I'm pleased to welcome to our program today three guests, uh, Natasha Dobbins, uh, Mariam Conte, and Caitlin Yee, who are involved with our Action Lab for Social Justice, and in particular, are working on the Action for Black Lives initiative. Um, they are students at the Columbia School of Social Work in their advanced year, and I think it's tremendous to have them on our program today, um, not just to get a student perspective on some very important work that's going on um, at the school uh, through this center, but also just to, um, to really uh, honor and acknowledge um, the, uh, the contributions that uh, students are making to the work of the Columbia School of Social Work. So um, again, welcome to Social Impact Live. Um, you know, I, I know we've talked about this before, but uh, um, the three of you haven't actually met in person. I mean, you're, you, you've, you've met on Zoom, um, but uh, you know, since the pandemic uh, began, you really haven't had a chance to meet each other in person. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> um, we've just formed a connection over bad FaceTime calls that keep dropping <laughs> and over Zoom, but somehow we've um, come together really well. So can I ask you, I mean, how did, how did you first come together? I mean, when did, when did you start working and when did you, um, you know, uh, become sort of student leaders of uh, this process where uh, we, we created this, this action lab? Um, can, can somebody sort of share that? Yeah, um, so I'll start. I, I think Tosh would um, say the same, but we didn't ever really expect to be in this place of student leadership. Really, I got here from a point of a lot of internal rage and frustration. Um, when George Floyd was basically publicly lynched in the middle of a pandemic that was disproportionately taking the lives of Black and Brown people, the evidence was just so overwhelming that our systems were not working. They were deeply flawed and deeply racist. But the more frustrating thing to me was that we always knew this to be true. Um, people in communities who experience like high rates of surveillance and incarceration know this. Historians, sociologists, lawyers, everyone who studies US systems know that they were designed to exclude people who are not considered white. Um, and it was frustrating to me that we knew this, but we keep doing the same thing. Um, and I wanted to know like, why, why do black people have to justify their humanity over and over again? Um, we, have, we have new ideas. We have um, a case for reparations. There are ideas for prison and police abolition and calls for transformative justice. And we learn about this in the social work school, but we never, um, we haven't fully pursued it. Um, and I wanted that to be pursued more genuinely. Um, and so I was feeling all this anger, but I also knew very well that I was part of the system. Um, so I started to ask like, how do I resist? Um, and I didn't know. And Black activists and Black women have been resisting for centuries. So I just started to look to them and what Black Lives Matter activists have been asking for um, in this moment. And I started to find a lot of information. It was really overwhelming. I put it into a Google document to help me organize my thoughts. And I shared it with a few close friends and they found it um, helpful and they asked that I shared it publicly, even though I don't like social media, I, I'm bad at it. I posted it on social media and that document I made started to turn into this shared project amongst all these people I didn't know. And it was really encouraging to see that energy. And I wanted to see how we could harness that energy into something that would last. So I emailed to professors that I was working with at the School of Social Work Dr. Patton, Dr. Woody. And I asked 
Um, you know, Dr. Patton, you've mentioned wanting to create a lab that would help students put ethics into action. And I don't know what that means and I don't know what that looks like, but can we start it now? Um, you've been doing COVID-19 work, but can we also create an initiative for Action for Black Lives? And he said, yes. Um, and he asked if I would want to lead it. And I almost said no, because as a non-Black Asian American person, I just didn't think that I could be leading this. Um, but at the same time, um, I know this work isn't about me. It's, it's about holding our institution to the values it espouses. And there are so many people that came before me and so many people that will come after me. So with that understanding, I said, sure. And thank goodness um, it was Tosh, Natasha and Miriam who came um, and they've just been incredible. Um, and they've taken this work to a place that I didn't know. Um, I didn't even know where it could go. Um, and it's been amazing, but it's also been really messy. And I think Tosh's side of the story really gets to the heart of that messiness. So I'm gonna hand it to her. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. I think for me, when the murder of George Floyd happened, I was overcome with grief and emotion and rage um, and, and just a feeling of sadness. And then when I found out about the document that Caitlin started, it, um, I really also, you know, I wanted to do something. I wanted to try to make a change and, and try to support myself and my community, right? Um, so I started working on the Action for Black Lives project with her. And then when it was revealed that she would be the leader of it, I um, was a little concerned. Not because I don't think that she can produce good work, but because I thought that the leader of an Action for Black Lives initiative should in some way be Black. And I had this conversation with Caitlin telling her, um, initially that I would be there to support her. Um, just because of her identity, there was gonna be things that she just doesn't understand, right? And at the time I was the only black person within our working group. Um, and I just felt that I should be a helping hand to her um, in order for her to, you know, try to figure stuff out. And as that conversation persisted, I ended up saying, you know what, once, the student body finds out that you're leading this group, we're going to look foolish. We're going to look ridiculous because there's no representation. Um, and that factor is really important, especially with historically, you know, the work of black people has been accredited to others and um, has been co-opted and, uh, yeah, so we had that conversation together and I ended up asking her if she felt like it would be okay if I were to co-lead for her. And at the time I never led or co-led anything. I, um, I was scared, honestly. Um, and I was also scared of being seen as the only black voice or black representative within the group, which I was at the time. And um, after we started it, I, I really advocated for other black students to come on board and we ended up having Miriam, who was great. And also uh, Shay, who is with us now, who's also wonderful. Um, Miriam, would you like to share now? Yeah, um, thank you, Natasha and Caitlin. Um, I came into this due to Dr. Williams. I had took a year off from school, a much needed year away from Columbia to just grow as a professional and just figure my life out. Um, and this was the opportunity that was presented to me. I was like, yeah, I'm all about social justices. I've had protests. I've, I'm all about Black Lives Matter, obviously, um, as a Black individual. And I was in, and I've been welcomed with open arms. The Action Lab has just been a place where voices are given to people who have been silenced, right? So as a team, we all have different identities, but I, I kind of want to say that this has been a healing process for us, right? Like a lot goes on in the classroom, a lot goes on um, with the murders and the lynching of black individuals and the black body where 
the conversation is happening. Usually these are things that happen in hush hush or just within your communities, within your families. But I feel like the action lab is talking about it. We're talking about the things that people turn their blind eyes to. We just had an event about colorism where who talks about colorism, right? Why is it even talked about? Um, so I think first things first is just to know that the action lab is just a conversation starter. Like we're talking about the things that like have not been talked about for centuries. And that's the reason why they keep on going because people have turned about blind eyes to it for so long. And I'll pass it back to you, Richard. Hey, well, thank you um, uh, for, for sharing your stories and, and just being so upfront about uh, uh, what it's been like for you as people, right? Not necessarily um, um, just as students, right? To be a part of, uh, uh, not just a process, but also a larger movement, I feel here. And, uh, I, you know, it's sort of being here at Columbia, being uh, or working uh, for a center, um, you know, you, we tend to sort of look at the, the more academic aspects, right? The research, the education, the trainings and things that we're doing, which are all very important. But, uh, um, you know, as as the names imply, the Action Lab and Action, I mean, we're, we're, we're not just about talk, right? We, we want this to translate into concrete acts, into into work that, that we can do and to, and to connect people, right? Um, to the things that they can do um, to, to address these issues. So, um, so can you bring us up to speed? What is the Action for Black Lives initiative doing right now? What are the projects? What are the kinds of things that you're, you're trying to accomplish um, you know, through this initiative? I can start. I think um, we formed a, a great group of wonderful people um, who have their own drives and their own stories that they want to tell and their own projects that they want to work on. Um, so I'm going to start off with Shay, who has uh, produced a newsletter called Melanated, which has been shared um, across the CSSW community. And uh, essentially, it shares Black stories, um, Black writings, soon to be Black art, um, and it highlights Black people within the CSSW community. And she's also the one who um, started the colorism group that Miriam graciously participated in. And like she said before, it was just wonderful to have people come together to share their experiences of something that's so unique within our community and um, affects us, I think, especially as um, Black women in a very unique way. Um, and we also have Notion who's very big on uh, community engagement and community organizing. So recently uh, she started a fund to get um, 10 students sponsored to campaign school um, to, I guess, just highlight their political awareness and drive for public office. Um, and we have Honor who is working closely with social work folks um, about, um, community engagement and, and voting as well. And um, she came out with a really great guide about voting and um, all the things that are happening with that, right? Um, elections in next week, let's hope for the best. Um. <laughs> Um, well, it's 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 a you know it's important to get out the vote, but I I also see that uh, protecting the vote is another issue that uh, your initiative uh, has embraced, and and I think it's really important what what you're saying about uh, not just um, you know uh, hearing the voices of 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 of. Uh, students of color and 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 um, that experience, but also institutionalizing it. You know, sort of putting that as part of of the institutional record and so on, so that we can be held accountable um, for for addressing those interests um, as an institution as well. So, um, yeah, I you know the, there's so much I think that that the initiative is doing, and uh, and I'm just you know wondering. Um, you know, are you? Do you feel like there's 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 progress being made? I know that this is a, you know, sort of an ongoing 
project and so on. Um, are we moving forward? Do you feel like things are 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 changing? I've you know, obviously this summer has been a a, a pivotal moment, um, you know, across the country in terms of mobilization and and advocacy and so on. But do you feel that this is something that is really reaching um, us here at the School of Social Work and 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 vice versa? Are there things that we can do to sort of move things forward um, within the larger community? I know. <laughs> Those are many questions, so um, you can pick whichever one you feel like responding to. But Mariam, you're you're nodding your head. Yeah, I'm nodding. Like, yes. Can he stop so I can go? Um, <laughs> absolutely. I think the first thing is asking yourself, like, what is progress, right? Like, I think for each and every one of us on this phone call, or in the action lab in general, we all have a different definition of progress. But the first step is that we're having a conversation. I'm going right back to having a conversation. We're sitting down with deans now. We're demanding things and we're amplifying voices of the student body. Um, yes, this probably happened before, and like there was a list of demands. I think back in 2016. Um, but this year we're not letting up. It's like something's going to happen. And it's really about like, you're going to listen to me and you're going to listen to us because it's not just the action lab, right? We represent, we're not representing everyone, but we represent the student body of Columbia. Um, and I think when we think of progress, we're thinking of great, like we, Caitlin and I are working on a project with a couple other people from AGPP and the Action Lab for Defund the Police, right? That's such a huge project that we're working on. But the first step is having the conversation. Who do we have the conversation to? Knowing who to go to. Um, so I'm really big about just talking about what's going on because I feel like Columbia has been so hush-hush, right? A student will come to someone and say, this professor made me feel a certain way and it was just get overlooked and more damage has been done. And talking to students who have graduated from this program, you leave with these unhealed wounds. Um, you leave with these things where you just feel like, oh, I'm just gonna go in the field. And my question then becomes, are you going to do more harm in the field? Um, leaving from a school that was supposed to build you. So I think um, it really just, I, I'm gonna throw the question back to you, Richard, of what do you think progress looks like for the action lab? Because and then I can throw it to Natasha and Caitlin of like what progress is there. Like at this point, we're just looking for something to be sustainable, right? Because we're going to leave, fingers crossed in 2021, if my professors are listening, I expect to pass. Um, I'm just joking, this is so, I'm just joking, but we're, we're going to graduate soon. And then what are the students who are going to take over? What are they gonna do? Um, what are demands? What does progress look like? So that is a good question um, for Natasha, Caitlin and Professor Hara. Yeah, I, you know, and, and I don't want to, uh, well, yeah, um, I, I know there's an issue, um, just continuity over time and making sure that students, even after they graduate, still uh, uh, remain involved and, you know, asking alumni and so on to participate in um, work groups and committees and, and so on to to help this this work move forward. So I, I think there's there's that issue. What does progress look like? I think, you know, as much as possible, what you're doing in terms of partnering with communities, right? Um, and making that impact. I think that for me is, I, you know, I, we can we can learn our lessons and we we do have to do work within uh, the School of Social Work, right, to, to make it <laughs> more just. Um, as you said, Mariam, you know, so our students don't leave with a, a sense of harm and need to heal afterwards. At the same time, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, this is something that is going to, you know, sort of uh, expand and amplify beyond the uh, boundaries of the school as well. And, and, you know, to sort of support what we've always done in social work, which is really try to partner as best we can with the uh, uh, communities and, 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 and people, people in need. So I think those, that's, that's hopefully where, um, well, at least from my perspective, um, you know, uh, progress in the future looks like. Um, I forgot to ask our audience to submit their questions early so that we could uh, um, take them during the course of the, the program. So there are a couple of questions and I know we have a few minutes left here, um, Mariam. So um, if it's okay, I wanna just sneak in a, a couple of them before we run out of time here. Um, and, and this is, let me just go to the, the uh, a question here at the bottom. Do you think it is more effective to work within the system or outside of it in regards to transformative justice, prison abolition, defund the police, etc.? cetera? Um, yeah, 
are, are do we work within the system or do we have to be uh, work from outside in order to affect transformative cha change? I think that for us, that's something we've been grappling with. What does it mean to be the action lab inside of Columbia University, a university that has been um, historically um, racist? You know, what does it mean to be within an Ivy League institution? Um, what does it mean to I guess, what are the goals and what does the work look, look like? It's limiting, right? We are limited in a way. We are confined by the standards of Columbia University. And what does that mean for the work that we've been doing? Um, so I think that's something that we have been questioning and continue to question. And as students, we are also limited in that capacity, right? So we're trying to see you know, where we stand and how much change we can make and how effectively we can be a part of the decision-making that's happening uh, specifically within the lab and what that looks like. Um, I think for systems as a whole, you know, people take different approaches. I think the end goal a lot of the times is the same that, you know, we want lives to be better for people. We want people to have rights and um, equity and equality, right? And people take different methods in order to get there. Um, so I think personally that it can be both. Um, yeah, at the very least, working within the system and trying to protect people, right? But you're still upholding the system by working within it. And then by working outside of it, you're trying to deconstruct the system as a whole. It's, it's a tough question. And certainly, yeah, I, I think that uh, we're, we're trying to work both sides of the street, certainly, you know, given our position inside and also um, trying to be that voice from the outside as well. Um, I guess uh, there's a, another question here. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to skip over uh, some of them here, but uh, um, for people in positions of privilege who have in the past not had to confront issues of race, but now want to engage their communities in those conversations, how do we do that? All right. More importantly, how can we elevate the marginalized voices in those communities to tell their own stories instead of others retelling them on their behalf? So how do we do that? How do we, how do we get those voices without sort of, you know, without the commentary? <laughs> I think my question first would be, um, why haven't you had to confront issues of race? Um, race affects all of us. Um, white people are only white because they have been racialized as so. Um, you know, there was a recent talk about on campus about like how Irish people became white in America. Um, so there is a, a very long history there and um, it's very complicated. Not sure I can get um, into it in the short amount of time, but I would say like really look into um, the history of how race was constructed in, in, in the US and how that affects white people too. And, and um, I think people who are in positions of privilege or feel like they haven't, um, I don't know, I think that capitalism, racial capitalism is damaging to all of us. And some people don't feel it as much as others because they have the money to, to cover up that pain, but it really, it does affect everyone and, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, I, I am concerned sometimes when people look to this movement as a way to like do charity. It's not, it's not charity. I think there needs to be work to understand that um, this is like about collective liberation. And if, if Black folks in our country don't have liberation, there's no liberation for anyone. Um, so I, that's it for me. Um, Natasha, Mariam, anything to add to that? Absolutely. I definitely think that 
just engage in the conversation with your communities. What's the worst that can happen, right? I think fear has held us back so much from having, you, you already know I'm so big on these conversations, going right back to my favorite word this whole life, conversation, have it. What's the worst that can come out of it? Um, I think so often we're just scared of, I'm going to say the wrong thing or, um, you know, I don't want to damage this relationship, but you know what's wrong. Um, we're talking about someone's life and way past color. You're talking about a human, someone who bleeds the same way you bleed. And you know something is wrong. So sitting, I feel like silence in a way is saying that I support what you are doing. Um, engage in it. We're so scared to have this conversation. It starts with, how do you feel about this? What do you think? Well, what can we do, right? And way past looking at it as black and white, this is someone's mother, someone's father, someone's sister, someone's child. Um, and take it from there. There's no research that can tell you what the community of colors are facing. So you know something is wrong, but now it's on TV. Now you see the lynching of black bodies. Um, for like myself and Natasha, this is our reality, 365 days. This is your coworkers reality, 365 days. What are you going to do? So I'm happy you asked this question. Now it's going back to asking yourself and reflecting, why are you holding back? Why isn't the conversation starting? Um, because this conversation just doesn't end when Natasha, Caitlin and Dr. Hara ends this, this fly. This conversation never stops. It keeps on going. And once we stop having the conversation, we are in fact contributing to white supremacy because they don't wanna talk about it. I, I can see that we're running a little bit over time and I don't wanna cut things off here because I just wanna ask one final question. I mean, talking about, I mean, we have to, we're all in this for the long run, right? Um, and it's, it's heavy lifting, it's, it's deeply personal. And, and I'm sure people are wondering, I mean, how, how do you, how do you keep going? How do you, how do you take care of yourself and support yourself and continue to do this work day in and day out? Um, you know, what are your suggestions? I think for me, going back to what Miriam said before, it's all about um, improving the circumstances, the circumstances of students to come. And that's a driving factor for me, um, trying to create some type of change where, you know, uh, black students won't have to go through what I went through, what Miriam went through here. Um, because a lot of times it's been devastating, you know what I mean? I can say that I feel like I've been surviving here and not thriving here, and I don't want anybody else to feel that way. Um, so I think that's definitely a big driving factor of mine to keep doing the work, even if it seems like the change that that's coming, you know, or the change that should have come already, right, um, is small. I think sometimes you just have to take small wins. I think that sometimes you just um, have to realize that, you know, you can work towards something and it might not get done while you're here now, but hopefully a continuation of the work uh, can happen so it can happen uh, with somebody else. And I'm still thinking about self-care and what that means. I need to work on that personally, <laughs> um, but yeah. All right, uh, Mariam, uh, what, what, what do you think? Uh, how do you take care of yourself? Do I even take care of myself? I don't think I do. I don't. At times I feel like I, I'm not worthy of taking care of myself, right? Um, I think because we're here, like we're in fact privileged, right? But I just can't picture myself just taking a break. I, I can't do that. I can't afford to do that because there are people that look like me that are dead because they look like me. And there are little children who look like me, who if I rest will have to come and go through the same thing. So I can't rest. I cannot take care of myself. The work keeps on going. I am up 24 seven, just thinking of what has changed? What does change look like? Um, I have a black brother. I have, I teach black students. So there's no self care. I owe it to them. And I feel this has been an ongoing thing for black folks where we're just like, we can't take care of ourselves, but there's no chance to do that. It, I'm sorry, just I don't have the room to just turn off social media and say, okay, today I'm just gonna disconnect myself from the world. 
no, I'm going to disconnect. But once I go outside and I see a police car, I'm scared. So there's no room for self-care. I just have to keep on going until change comes and I won't rest until change comes, whether it's Colombia or the overall problem, which is white supremacy. And Caitlin, any, any last words um, either on self-care or how, as, how we can provide that kind of support to people? I think I would echo um, Natasha and Miriam. I haven't been the greatest at self-care, but I think a lot of the care comes from the Action Lab community. I think that there have been a lot of reminders from each other and a lot of checking in with each other. And what I'm noticing is that we're not just a research place. We're actually building a community where we're trying to ourselves live out the values that we want to see in the world. And I think it's a place of creation and like experimenting with what community care looks like. So no thanks to myself, but all thanks to like my team members and Dr. Williams and all of our leaders, I feel supported in the work, even though it is exhausting. I'm so sorry, Richard. And we also want to echo Dr. Williams, like we have a new leader. Um, and this was her message to us yesterday, and it really resonated. And we asked her, what was her mission? What was her vision for the action lab going forward? And she said, it's really about listening to the voices of students, narratives of justice, looking at micro and macro to work towards educating, uprooting, and being about the actionable ways that we can fight for justice. Your voices as passionate students will be enough. And that's a message that we just wanna send out to those who are in Colombia still that you have someone who is ready to listen to your voice now. All right, well, Miriam, Natasha, Caitlin, thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts and, and, and experience with us here today at Social Impact Live. Thank you. We'll wrap up the, uh, today's program here uh, now. And uh, just a, a note, we won't be uh, airing next week. I think in two weeks we'll be back and uh, we'll have Beth Councilman Carpenter to talk about child welfare and telehealth in the age of COVID-19. So until then, take care, stay well. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.